Uh, hi, uh, I'm Richard Mills from Argonne National Laboratory, and uh, this morning I am going to be um, trying to do a, um, a brief introduction to Petsy and Tau, just sort of by uh, example, is the theme that I and my co-presenter uh, Matt Nepley from the University of Buffalo agreed upon. So um, we're going to try to do this in, in sort of two distinct parts. First, we're going to look at solving nonlinear equations with the scalable nonlinear equation solvers component of PETSI, or SNES. And then uh, we'll shift to Matt giving a sort of survey or tour of applications of PETSI tau to different types of physics. So um, the goals and agenda today are really to uh, introduce several key concepts and common patterns that show up in PETSI um, by examples and demonstrations using the SNES component. So, uh, some of the things we'll highlight is how you can use Petsy runtime options to uh, query what's happening, how your solver's set up, um, how you set problem parameters, um, specify solver options, and build and experiment with uh, at runtime uh, pretty sophisticated composite solvers on the command line. Um, we'll talk about the sort of user callback paradigm that's common to, uh, to Petsy components. It's used in SNES, but many other as well. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how PETSI DM objects uh, help manage mesh-like objects and their interactions with algebraic solvers, and Matt in particular will um, give several examples that, that show how sophisticated this can be. Um, we'll talk some about how PETSI uses GPU accelerators because this is just um, something that's been of, of great interest in recent years. And uh, along with that, um, we'll show a little bit how to use the built-in logging framework in Petsy to understand and tune performance so you can tell if you know, you're actually uh, getting anything out of these GPU accelerators. And um, once we go through these things with SNES, uh, we'll, we'll transition to Matt um, showing uh, various examples of Petsy being used to solve problems with, with many different kinds of, of, of physics. Um, so uh, first, I want to start with telling people on how to get help. Um, this is with uh, you know, installation or uh, you know, the examples or anything else. Um, unfortunately, we only had an hour and a half for this tutorial because we had so many great talks that have been submitted. So due to time constraints, we're just not going to cover Petsy installation. I feel like this is kind of cheating for a beginner tutorial, but um, there's a lot of information about this online. And um, there, there, I, will, I will share these slides uh, in just a bit. And, um, uh, all these links in here are clickable, so you can find inf tutorials or information at, at, at this uh, link here. Um, you can get help via email, via these two different methods, or uh, of course you can get help at the meeting. There are a lot of experienced Petsy developers and users here, so uh, just get the attention of one of us, or, uh, or you can try uh, asking your questions on the Petsy Meeting 2023 Slack channel. Um, so I'm going to begin with this sort of uh, like synoptic overview of the components of Petsy and how it's sort of organized. Um, there's this sort of like hierarchical organization of Petsy where um, uh, you have at, at the bottom things like the VEC and MAT classes that, that implement basic linear algebra operations. And then built on top of that is preconditioners, PC, uh, KSP, Krelov subspace linear solvers. Uh, and, and DM at about this level, and uh, then using that is SNES, and then above that there are things like the time steppers or the tau numerical optimization solvers. Um, this, uh, this, uh, this organization's um, been important because, um, you know, the, the things like up here at this level, like they use a bunch of the stuff down here, and you'll see this is actually how uh, we currently make uh, the Petsy GPU backends uh, work. You know, you can, you can put together like a high level TS problem, and we'll use the vector and matrix classes uh, to run on the GPUs um, as appropriate. So what we're going to talk about today is, uh, I the first part of the tutorial is, is we're going to talk about uh, this, this level of Petsy here, SNES. So uh, I should start with just a little bit of background on, uh, on solving nonlinear equations. Um, I assume many of you already know this stuff. There may be some students who, who aren't that experienced with this. So but briefly, we're going to look at using SNES, which solves systems of nonlinear equations of, uh, of this form here. Um, and these arise in just all kinds of settings in computational science. Um, for these things in general, direct methods don't exist, so you have to use an iterative method. Um, the simplest sort of thing to do is, is a nonlinear Richardson iteration, uh, which has linear convergence at best. 
Um, then there are nonlinear Krilov methods like nonlinear conjugate gradient, nonlinear GM res, or, or the closely related Anderson mixing, um, which um, have superlinear convergence at best. Um, but the thing that everybody tends to use is, uh, is Newton's method, um, which is uh, really the workhorse of, of nonlinear solvers. So um, just to briefly outline it, this is, this is basically just a, uh, a, everybody's seen this in Calculus 1 class. So um, you start with the, the standard form of a nonlinear system here, um, and you want to find the zeros of it. You, uh, you solve by, you know, linearizing to get this Jacobian system, and then you, you solve that for an update. And, uh, you know, we all saw this again in, in Calculus 1 class in just, you know, like one dimension, but we just uh, extend this to, you know, however many um, uh, using matrix uh, algebra here. And the great thing about Newton's method is that it is quadratically convergent near a root. So, uh, you know, here's an example of just writing this out for a nonlinear Poisson problem. Um, in practice, um, when we're solving these things iteratively, we don't want to ex incur the expense of an exact solve. So this here, we don't need to solve this equation exactly. Uh, it's often not desirable to do that. So in practice, everybody uses uh, inexact Newton methods that find some approximate Newton direction that satisfies this relationship uh, for some forcing term that uh, can be static or chosen adaptively. Like in PETC, uh, you, you can specify SNES, KSP, EW to use the Eidenstadt Walker uh, heuristic for, for choosing this. And uh, newton krilov methods, which use Krilov subspace projection methods as the inner linear solve to solve that Jacobian system are a robust and very widely used variant. And PETC provides a very wide range of Krilov methods and linear preconditioners that can be accessed via runtime options. And we'll, we'll show this uh, a little bit, some examples. Um, the other thing I need to mention uh, before we dive into, into actually using PETC is that Newton methods, right, they have quadratic convergence, but only when your iterate is sufficiently close to the solution. And if you're far from that solution, the computed Newton step is often too large. So in practice, we use some globalization strategies. Um, there are a lot of different things that PETC supports. Uh, the most common thing and the default that you get in PETC is a backtracking line search where you just replace the full Newton step uh, with some scalar multiple of that um, by solving this simple minimization problem, um, uh, a, a cheap minimization problem that gives you a pretty reasonable, uh, you know, model for this. And uh, that's, um, you know, what, we're gonna, what you get by default when you, when you run with Petsy uh, SNES. Okay, so I should talk about how you specify the SNES problem. And uh, I'm sorry that this keeps showing up over all my titles, but uh, I don't know what else to do. Uh, <laughs> um, so to solve the SNES problem, um, you need, of course, uh, have a way to, to specify the thing. And um, Petsy SNES interface is, uh, is based upon uh, callback functions. In this case, there's like a form function, uh, which you call by a SNES set function. And there's a form Jacobian um, set by a SNES set Jacobian. Uh, and actually, these are, um, I'm, I'm I'm skipping over some details. These are the, the very simplest things, are SNES set function, but there are all kinds of different variants depending on whether or not uh, you want, say, um, there's like a SNES set uh, function local uh, where uh, you, you tell Petsy, like, okay, I'm going to specify my problem, but I'm only doing it on local patches, and Petsy's going to handle a bunch of the, the, the parallel communication details for you and just give you that patch. But uh, basically, everything involves having a, a set function, this is your nonlinear residual or, or Jacobian. And when Petsy needs to evaluate this nonlinear residual f, it's going to call the user's function that's been specified uh, by this set function routine. So um, you know, this could be uh, a function that exists in some code that you have written and you are not yet using Petsy. You just are going to modify that a little bit so that it's callable uh, via the API that, um, that Petsy expects. Um, and this user function is going to get application state through this, uh, this CTX variable, this user context. So Petsy never actually sees the application data. And uh, this user callback paradigm is followed by a whole lot of other Petsy components, as we'll see later, especially in Matt's uh, half of the tutorial. And it does not change even when doing things like using GPU accelerators that we'll, we'll also see. So um, this SNES function uh, that calculates a nonlinear residual um, has this, this call signature. Uh, where there's a, a current solution, the iterate that we're working on, uh, a residual, and, uh, and then this user context that holds the application information, you know, physical constants, whatever that is, is needed by the sort of user physics. 
And then uh, there's a SNES Jacobian um, excuse me, that has, uh, has this signature here, uh, similar kind of thing where you've got a Jacobian here, J, and then there's a, a separate J pre, the Jacobian preconditioning matrix, because maybe you don't want to use the full Jacobian for the preconditioner, although a lot of times uh, you, you, this is just J. And again, this user, con uh, user <coughs> context. And uh, alternatively, you can use this, uh, you, you, can, you can specify this um, yourself. Uh, you can build the Jacobian yourself, but you can also tell Petsy to do things like um, construct it via finite differencing, which it can do efficiently using a, a coloring scheme. Uh, or, uh, I mean, you can also, um, some people use like automatic differentiation if you want to, to use something like that as well. Um, so we're going to start by looking at um, SNES example 19, which is a steady state nonlinear driven cavity problem um, where, uh, you know, I've written out the, the equations here, but we're just solving a, a two, this on a 2D square domain. It's got a, a moving lid at the top. Um, it's non-isothermal, so there's a temperature variable. Uh, Flow is driven by this lid motion and, uh, and buoyancy effects. Uh, it uses a velocity vorticity formulation uh, due to David Keyes. Uh, it uses a finite difference discretization over a logically regular grid, so we're going to handle the aspect of that. We're going to handle that with, uh, with a special kind of DM, a DMDA, or I think DA used to stand for distributed array or something like that. Um, in this case, we're actually not providing an analytical Jacobian. It's just calculated by finite differences using coloring, and uh, probably lots of people who've run Petsy have encountered this problem because when you run Petsy's make check to make sure that uh, your installation is working, it, it runs this example. Um, and the example is here in, in the Petsy directory at source SNES tutorials ex19.c. And I have it pulled up here. I was actually thinking I would uh, show some of the code in the code editor, but it's a little, I wasn't happy with uh, the amount of screen real estate I'm able to get on, on here. So let's see, it might look, look better in here. Uh, actually, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stick with the slides because I, I, I'm not happy with all the, the space that this is taking up. Um, but this is all, you know, I'm just, the, these slides are just, you know, looking at, at what, is, what is in the, in the code here. Um, so the, the imp important things to point out in the example are, are one, this, uh, you know, I mentioned this user context. So uh, in the code, we define this user uh, defined data structures. So just co-located at each node, we have our, uh, our four variables for our degrees of freedom. And we have uh, this, this struct here that holds the physical parameters that, that set up the problem, like the lid velocity, uh, grasshop number, Prandtl number. Um, and then there's also something here in case you want to uh, use a, uh, an option to, to draw contours of your solution. So this is just this application context here. And uh, man, I really wish I knew how to make this, uh, this thing go away. <laughs> I just have to like wait a second, right? Every time you move your mouse over the, the smaller version, it opens itself up. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Well. All right. So here's here's the um, the, the form function, and in this case, um, it, we're using a form function local uh, that I've talked about. And um, the the important thing, uh, well, there are several important things here. But one thing I, I really want to point out, and I'm careful, I'm, I'm afraid of pointing at it with my mouse. But up at the top, there is this DMDA local info, and um, this holds some information about the parallel grid that we're running on. And uh, you see here, um, let's see, there's, there's info, and it tells you basically a bunch of things about uh, you know, what, what's, what the, the layout of your grid is, where your corners are, stuff like that. Um, and Petsy is handling this information for you, and this really simplifies your life if you're writing a parallel MPI code, especially if you've not done this before. Um, when I started using Petsy, I actually thought this was like one of the most helpful things about Petsy was the DM and, and it handling a bunch of stuff. So I could write a function that does my physics and I only have to worry about, you know, computing, you know, a portion of the, the residual over the local patch that, that Petsy just gives me because DMDA is handling all this stuff. So uh, here's what our form function local is. You're just doing finite differencing um, and then that's, you know, that we've, we've basically specified our problem right there because uh, we, we have something that builds locally the Jacobian, I mean, sorry, the residual, and, uh, and that, that's encoding all the physics of our problem. 
So uh, let's try to actually run this thing. And uh, I will note um, there is, uh, let's see, actually, uh, it, could, Matt, could you um, like take the PDF of the slides and just like post them on the Slack channel right now? Yeah, yeah because I want people to be able to actually, uh, these slides have a bunch of clickable links in here. And uh, I just um, wanted to point out, I actually have a link here to um, a web page that has kind of, you know, easily cut and pasteable uh, instructions for, for this. They were, um, these are actually exercises I came up with last year um, for a, uh, a, an Argon training workshop. And so I'm just going to refer to the same thing here. So I can, you know, click on this, it brings up uh, this page, and, and we're just going to save a little bit of time. I'm going to cut and paste. Uh, some of the examples out of here. So, all right, so I'm going to run this. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, so uh, I'm just going to run this here where I'm going to run on just a single processor, the EX19 example, uh, with a bunch of options that I'll, I'll talk about. And, oops, what happened? Oh, I'm in the, in the wrong directory. Okay. Okay in the tutorials directory, there we go. Okay, so I ran the problem and it did something. So let's first talk about um, what, what these, these, uh, these various command line options are doing. Um, so the first thing that we're telling it is, is we're adding a SNES monitor. So PETC, by default, when it, it solves a problem, it doesn't give you any output to standard out or any diagnostic information like that. So we want to actually show the progress of the SNES solver. So we add this. There are monitors for all kinds of things that you might use in PETC, uh, TS, KSP, whatever. They're all, they're all these different monitors. Uh, they're customizable. Um, then I actually want to know when the SNES solver finishes, I would like to know why it did so. And, you know, did, why, did it converge? Did it diverge? If so, why? Um, then I, you know, I mentioned we're using a DMDA. Here I'm specifying uh, the initial grid points to use in this direction, and X and Y direction. So I start with a 16 by 16 grid. And then I'm telling DA to actually start from that, the DMDA to start from that grid and then refine it two times uh, to give me a bigger grid. And then um, we're setting this lid velocity, which is this dimensionless number, and, and the Grasshoff number. And uh, the thing that I, I really want to point out is an element of the Petsy design philosophy is really extensive runtime custom customizability. So um, there are all these things you can control from the command line. You can use uh, dash help to enumerate and explain the various command line options available. And uh, I'll just show here. So if I add help, um, it, it gives me a bunch of like context sensitive uh, information about, um, you know, what you know, what, what I can be specifying. Um, so if I'm doing things like I'm doing a multi-grid solve and I say dash help, it will tell me a bunch of options like here are, here are things that you can do uh, with the multi-grid solver, for instance. So um, always resort to using help when you don't know uh, what's going on and how to, how to control stuff. So, okay, that's just showing, uh, you know, what happened when we ran the thing. So, all right. And so let's see what the SNES solver is actually doing. So we add... Uh, this SNES view option. So it's going to run the thing, and then it shows me, um, you know, I, I think it's, let's see, is it easier to see this on the slide? Yeah, OK. Um, again, the, the fonts are so big on this display, I'll, I'll just use what's in here. So. Um, I asked Petsy to tell me what's going on by, t by giving it SNES view. So it tells me, okay, I'm running, uh, I've got a SNES object. Uh, it's running on one MPI process. The type is a Newton method with a line search, so Newton LS. Uh, say things about the tolerances, maximum number of iterations here. It's telling me that I'm building the Jacobian using colored finite differences on a DMDA. Um, it tells me information about the line search object, which is something I can customize. I can change what this is doing via the command line options if I want to. It tells me what KSP object is being used to solve the, uh, the Jacobian problem and how it's being preconditioned. So there's, there's all kinds of stuff that it tells you. And uh, because in Petsy you can, you can build really arbitrarily complicated solvers with many different levels, uh, hierarchy, compositions of different solvers, uh, it's really useful to, to be able to get this information. 
Okay, and the other thing is uh, I just showed you guys a whole lot of um, just different runtime options to start with. Um, all these can be set via the command line, but I do note it's also possible to uh, have input files that do this. You can set these with shell environment variables. There's a, an API to set these programmatically in your C code if you want. And so to facilitate readability for the rest of these examples, I'm going to put some command line objects common to the remaining hands-on exercises in, in this Petsy options uh, environment variable. And again, I'm just going to copy and paste out of here to save some time in typing. So, okay, I'm going to... All right, so I've set uh, a bunch of uh, options here because we, we always want to see what's going on with this, the solution, how it converged. We're going to keep the same lid velocity, starting grid size. We want to see the reason the, the, the KSP solver, the interlinear solver, converges. And then I'm also adding this log view um, where it's going to print out some of the Petsy logging information about what's going on performance-wise. So, all right. So yeah, I'm adding this because this is going to let us uh, find the overall wall clock time. And there's a whole lot of stuff in here, but right now we're just going to be grepping for the time uh, in this, this text file that gets generated. So, um, so let's experiment a little bit with this example. So uh, you know, Petsy defaults to an exact Newton, um, but if I wanted to run an exact Newton, I can just, uh, I can just do this. So let's, let's just do an experiment. I'll cut and paste this in here. OK. So now what I've done is I've told it uh, the, the preconditioner type is LU, is a direct solver. So it's just, you know, it's going to precondition the system by just solving it exactly. So uh, this is actually a really useful thing to be able to, to, to do. Um, I use it a lot when I'm debugging something that I'm doing to tell that I'm not, you know, getting weird answers because of. Uh, you know, something going on with the, uh, the inner iterative solver, you know, just, just, just a sanity check is, am I actually giving it the right, you know, physics? Um, so, okay, so we've done that, and on this machine it took like four and a half seconds. Uh, so, let's see, um, and you can, you can, um, okay, so I ran it with uh, inexact Newton. Um, now I'm going to run uh, some different so I ran it with exact Newton. Now I'm going to try, you know, messing with inexact Newton, just vary the linear solve tolerance. So go back to here. And uh, so, yes? Uh, okay, so. so Oh, so um, yeah, so the instructions were, were from a, for a different workshop where I set up stuff on a computer that, that students were running on. Um, in, in this case, if you have a working Petsy installation, and it, like make check works, like if you run make check, it is building this file. Um, you can just go into your Petsy source SNES tutorials and then do make EX19, and you should get that. And if it's not working for you, one of the other Petsy developers right now should go over and look at, look over your shoulder and help you with this. Okay, thank you for asking. Yes? And, uh, I, just, I just finally got post date. Can you hear can I start recording on Zoom? Yes. Okay, yeah, sorry that we missed the... Okay, let's see, where were we? Okay, I was, I was gonna show, okay, so I showed, um, I, we just ran an example here where we just said, like, solve the, uh, the, the Jacobian system exactly. Um, now we're gonna mess around with uh, this tolerance that we solve it to. So you can just um, specify this by dash KSP, R tall, specify the relative tolerance. Let me do that. And let's see, so that took, uh, that took longer than solving um, the, uh, the, the system exactly with LU. Um, but we can, you know, we can mess around with, with these, these different tolerances, so you know, I can try. Uh, I'm going I'm to solve it really loosely and see how, how quickly that goes. And uh, okay, so that one, that was a lot faster. Let's do, you know, that, that was like less than two seconds. Um, but we're doing a lot more inner iterations. So it, just, just illustrating that, um, you know, sometimes it's worth 
doing more inner iterations or, or uh, sometimes it's, it's worth looking at the trade-off between inner and outer iterations. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm going, uh, I want to make sure Matt's got enough time so I don't, uh, I don't need to actually go run through everything I, I suggested here. But these are some exercises to look at, like try playing around with this and see what happens to the SNES iteration count when it diverges, what yields the shortest execution time, et cetera. Um, okay, so one thing that I um, often have students do when, when looking at this is uh, we look at what happens to the iteration counts and the execution time as we scale up the grid size. So for this exercise, we're going to run in parallel because the experiments take too long uh, uh, otherwise. And uh, also, we're going to switch from using the default uh, GM res with restart size of 30, which is just what you get when you ask Petsy to do this. We're going to change this by specifying the KSP type uh, to BCGS for BCG stabilized. So let's, tr uh, let's try doing the same thing. Uh, OK, go back to here. And let's just jump to, uh... OK, so now I'm going to run this, this here, where we, you know, we're already, you know, we've got a bunch of Petsy options already set in our uh, environment variables. Uh, and the thing I'm going to change, I'm going to add some additional options. The KSP type is the BICG stab. And uh, I'm going to refine the grid, do, do four refinements. So it's going to be quite, uh, quite a bit larger grid. And I'll run this on eight processors on my laptop. while it's doing that, um, you know, the thing to do is mess with this, run with the default preconditioner, see what happens to the iteration counts and ex execution time. Oops, I started with four. Um, it's taking quite a lot of, uh, of inner iterations is a thing to observe. So at, at four, it's doing, you know, like several hundred uh, linear solver iterations to get convergence. Uh, on the Jacobian solve. And let's go back to try it with just refining it twice. And you'll see, okay, we're spending a lot less time solving that linear solve. But as we, as we refine the grid, get a, get a finer problem with more degrees of freedom uh, total, uh, we, we take a lot more time. Uh, so we're doing a lot more iterations. So um, that's bad, right? And so what we want to do is let's try using something that we know should be uh, algorithmically scalable and we're going to try using geometric multigrid. So what we're going to do is like I can do the same thing here where I was doing uh, DA refine 4. And I'm going to say um, PC type MG. So now I'm going to default to using Petsy's uh, multigrid uh, with a, with a V-cycle. Okay, so now we've gone from doing, you know, like 500 iterations to like six or seven on there because, uh, because multigrid is, is asymptotically scalable, uh, unlike what, what we were doing before. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll go to the next thing. Okay, so, so now let's, let's try playing with the same problem, but let's tr see what happens as we um, increase the nonlinearity of it by uh, raising the Grasshoff number. So I'll just. OK, so that's running it with a grasshop number of 100. Now let's see. Let's increase this a couple orders of magnitude and see what happens. OK, so I've, we've gone up to uh, 1e to 4. And if I, I already, you know, I'm cheating. I already met, played around with this. But if you just go a little bit higher, like 1.3e to the 4, then you start to run into difficulties. Or you did the last time I ran this. Let's see what happens when we run it now. It's thinking hard. Okay, well, clearly, clearly it's unhappy. Okay, yeah, so, it, so what happened was um, it, it ran the 10,000 iterates, and we set, um, we set a max iterates uh, of 10,000. So it, it gets to that, and it still hasn't converged. It says we diverged. So yeah, nonlinear solver didn't converge. 
Well, the linear solver did not converge because we get the max number of iterations. So the nonlinear solver did not converge. OK, so, so we get a failure in the linear solver there. And again, this is, we went back to just using the default preconditioner that's a, a incomplete LU factorization. Uh, with zero fill this is the default. So that's what happened. Let's try uh, doing the same thing with a stronger preconditioner. So let's, let's try doing this and say, okay, now we're going to do PC type MG. So, because we know multigrid should be a lot more scalable. Let's see what happens. Okay, no problem at all. So uh, this is a really good illustration of the importance of choosing a good preconditioner for your problem. And then, uh, okay, so now, now we, let's, okay, now I'm going to play a game where I, let's see, I go uh, 1, 3, 3, 7, 3, and let's see what happens. 1, 3, 3, 7, 3. So we're going to make it, the problem a little, the nonlinear linearity a little harder. And so, you know, the multigrid preconditioner is, is doing okay inside the, uh, the iterative, inside the linear solve, right? Um, but, uh, Eventually, we get a problem. Okay, we hit, we hit a problem here where we've diverged in the line search. So um, the the inner the inner linear solver was doing okay, but uh, you know with, with the the outer part, you know, we're with the line search part of the Newton iteration, we have a problem. So let's see. Okay, so yeah, actually, let's just let's just say okay, all right, we tried PC type MG. Let, let's just let's just you know throw the big hammer at it, and we'll 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 just solve it exactly with with LU. Okay, so the, uh, the nonlinear solver, the, the Newton solver is still, it's, it's having some difficulties, even though there's, there's definitely nothing going on. Yeah, say we've, we've hit, hit the max number of iterations that we, we can do for that. Um, let's see. So, uh, strong linear solver here doesn't help us. We already showed one example, right, where uh, you know, we went from just a, you know, ILU zero preconditioner to multigrid, and that helped some, let us increase the nonlinearity some. We increase the nonlinearity a little bit more. Multigrid couldn't handle that. And then we try LU. Still, it, it doesn't help. Um, so let's try combining Newton's method with one of the other nonlinear solvers that I mentioned in the introduction, um, using Petty's support for nonlinear composition and preconditioning. So I need to have a little bit of background about um, what I'm talking about here. So to discuss nonlinear composition and preconditioning, we've got to introduce a few definitions and notation. So our prototypical nonlinear equation is of this form, uh, fx equals b, right? In the linear case, this fx is just, you know, ax, right? ax equals b, but we're, we're looking at a nonlinear variant here. So we define the residual, again, analogously, like to how you would in a linear problem, which residual is uh, f of x minus b. And so we're going to use this notation um, here for the action of a nonlinear solver to get your next iterate, so this, this uh, script m. And so nonlinear uh, composition, um, we're going to look at additive composition first. Nonlinear composition consists of having a sequence of two or more nonlinear solver methods, M and N, which both provide some approximate solution to this Fx equals B. And in the linear case, application of a stationary solver by defect correction can be written like this, where, where P inverse is a linear preconditioner. And this is just Richardson iterate. Like the first thing you see in a, in a linear solver's course uh, you know, when you look at iterative methods, maybe, is, is this Richardson iteration just applied to a preconditioned system. Um, so we can have an additive composition of preconditioners, uh, P inverse and Q inverse, with, with different weights here, written like this. And then analogously, for the nonlinear case, additive composition is written like so. And again, I don't expect everybody to follow along here, but you can look at the slides later or at the, at the paper that I'll, I'll link to where this is, this is talked about. We can also do multiplicative um, combinations. So uh, writing things out like this, uh, with we, we've got these uh, xk plus 1 half and xk. Um, you have the, inverse, the application of the p inverse and the q inverse. Or analogously for linear, the nonlinear case, we've got, we've got this here. 
which simply indicates we're updating the solution using the current solution in residual with the first solver, and then we update the solution again using the resulting new solution and new residual with the second solver. Um, we can also do uh, nonlinear left preconditioning and right preconditioning, but I, I want to make sure we have enough time for math, so I, I won't I won't go through the, you know, people just go back and look at this and then look at the paper that's, that's linked in the next slide. Uh, but you can do nonlinear left preconditioning or right preconditioning. And these are um, all these different, there are all these different ways of combining nonlinear solvers uh, via compositions or preconditioning um, that are supported here. And there's a clickable link here to the paper on composing scalable nonlinear algebraic solvers from Siam Review that talks about how this works. Uh, you can also look in the manual pages for SNES Composite and SNES Get uh, NPC for the nonlinear preconditioner. So let's go back to now trying uh, some of this stuff. So we're going to try nonlinear re. Let's see, actually, let's, hold on. Let's see here. Uh, okay. Let's try an example. We're going to first try nonlinear Richardson preconditioned with a Newton solver. So I will. Again, cheat on my typing and just cut and, cut and paste here. So um, we're running with uh, just this, this uh, two refinements. We're going back to this problematic Grashoff number that you know, we couldn't get convergence on even when we used LU in the inner solver. And now we say the SNES type is nonlinear Richardson. And the nonlinear preconditioner SNES type is Newton with a line search. And, uh, we're going to uh, use a multigrid on the inside for the linear solve. Okay, it's uh, doing something, we hope. Um, okay, so I think, um, so if you're following along like on the instructions on that web page for my at PESC workshop tutorial last summer, um, there's a step in there where I set a, a export a Petsy options environment variable that's, that's setting some of these parameters and maybe you didn't do that. Yeah, so, so that, so you're getting a little bit uh, different problem. And then, okay, let's see, uh, what happened here? Uh, okay, so let's see, what did I do here? Is that what was supposed to happen? <laughs> I'm gonna cheat, what, what happened before? Yeah, okay, so it, it, it let's see. Okay, so I tried that with multigrid and it, it still didn't work, but I found if I, I try this with an LU uh, on the in solver on the inside, then it, then it should work. At least it did last time I tried it. Okay, then, so now it's, it's making some progress. So um, we can try this. We get a little bit farther. So nonlinear Richardson preconditioned with Newton lets us go a little bit farther than Newton alone, but we're still having to you know, go back to, to using an LU solve on the inside, which is not, not what we want to do. So, uh, yeah, and I just, uh, again, I'm gonna skip over some of this stuff because I'm running out of time for Matt. You know, I, 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 if you experiment with this, you can try pushing the Grassoff number a little bit farther. Um, and eventually you, you hit another barrier and it, it doesn't work even though we're, we're using the heavy hammer of the LU solver on the inside. So let's try switching things up and now we're gonna try preconditioning Newton with nonlinear Richardson. So we're just, we're just swapping the order. That, you know, we're, we're swapping what was the preconditioner and what's the, the outer solver. So, so let's just try that and see how it does. And again, this is something, uh, the, the, the point here is it's letting us, um, you know, we're able to, to, to just do these experiments, you know, just on the command line. Like, I don't have to write any code. I can just say, okay, now I'm going to just swap, you know, I'm going to change uh, really fundamentally what I'm doing for the nonlinear solver just by changing up the command line options.
So we just swapped what was the preconditioner and what was the, the, you know, the, the outer nonlinear solver. And uh, well, now it's at least making some kind of progress, though it is taking a, a, a pretty large number of SNES iterations. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead because we're running out of time. OK, so it, it actually it works, but it takes like 350-something iterations to do. Um, but then you can play around with some other options like, OK, in, in this case, I was, uh, I was actually only doing one iteration of the preconditioner. I can change it to three just by changing this, this parameter here. And, uh, and then it actually works really well. In fact, I'll just kill this because it's going to take too long. And I'll say, OK, now do three, out, three iterations uh, in the preconditioner. Um, and then that is enough to, uh, to make the problem uh, pretty tractable. OK, uh, let's see. And then um, as an exercise, you, know, you can try messing around with, with you know, the number of iterations you do in here. Uh, see what, it, it's kind of interesting to see you know, how this affects the, uh, the convergence of your outer nonlinear solver, but um, I'm going to skip over that. And then I'm just going to end by noting that you can actually push the Newton method preconditioned with nonlinear Richardson extremely far. So, like if I do this one, okay. So I'm going to run the same thing where I'm pushing the Grasshoff number to one uh, times ten to the you know to ten to ten to the sixth power. This is this is an extremely nonlinear problem. And if I use this preconditioner, and I also in this case I still had to resort to using PC type LU. Like this this will run. Um, and this is um, let's see, Matt Matt, do you have thoughts on just like just can can you put into context like how nonlinear a problem this is, or how hard that is. Okay, so, so Rayleigh number of the Earth is 1e to the 7th, and so we're, we're doing like one order of magnitude less than that, and, and it's, it's able to work. It's, it's pretty impressive that, that you can do this just by um, changing things up. So, okay. So basically, the, the, you know, this, this does work, and, and really um, the, the takeaway I wanted to get from this quick um, you know, run through these examples, and I hope that you get a chance to, uh, if you're a new Petsy user, to go and actually try these. Um, like link to that web page, and, and I've got you know, different questions to try to answer when you experiment with these. But the takeaway is that uh, Petsy's design that's really um, uh, approaches this philosophy of supporting really extensive runtime experimentation and composition um, enables people to experiment in real time, um, you know, just, just at their console to discover effective approaches for what's the best solver when you can't determine what that is a priori. And uh, for most really interesting problems, there just is not a way to determine this a priori. We don't have the proper kind of performance models to know what the best solver is. So being able to experiment with this is, uh, is really powerful and probably my favorite thing about, about Petsy. So OK. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so the question is, um, you know, I ran some of these with one, process, one, one MPI process and some with eight. Um, I was just trying to kind of keep things from getting too complicated, but when I ran things with more processors, it's because um, I was increasing the size of the problem too big to, to be able to, you know, it just takes forever on one processor. That, that's the only real reason. So um, the, the methods that, yeah, the, that's a very good question. Will, will some of these methods be affected adversely by running on eight processors? OK, so, so a couple things. In the cases where I'm using the LU solver, I'm using Petsy's built-in sequential LU solver. It just runs on one process. And it's really for just you know, a lot. It's for debugging stuff or for doing uh, something where you're, you're doing like a small, you, you, might, you might be running it inside a, an MPI parallel thing, which you're just solving like a little, you know, portion of the problem, or you've restricted your problem down to just, you know, one one CPU, something like that. 
Um, the default preconditioner in PETC that you get when you just tell it to solve a, a linear system is it uses, um, it uses GM res with a restart size of 30 and uh, a block Jacobi preconditioner with ILU applied on each block. So you will get worse convergence with this single level domain decomposition as you, as you, you know, go up from one processor to eight to 64. You'll see increasingly worse convergence because when you are in parallel like that, you need a multi-level method. But if you uh, run like with the multi-grid preconditioner, then there is no uh, real downside to using more of the, um, of, of the MPI processes. Okay. Um, well, I took like 45 minutes already. Uh, <laughs> you can definitely do the GPUs. Okay, well, I, I will spend like just 10 minutes like talking about, about GPUs. This is sort of a bonus thing. And so everything I've talked about so far is really just totally orthogonal to the topic of how to run PETC solvers on GPUs. But this has become pretty important, so I want to just like briefly explain how this works. And so first I'll show this, this conceptual kind of cartoon of how we want uh, GPU usage and performance portability to, to work in PETC. And, and what we're going for is a separation of concerns between like the application code, the user code domain, and what PETC does on the back end. And uh, the important thing to note here is that um, you know, we support a bunch of different GPU programming models. And the GPU programming model that PETC uses, like inside its GM res or whatever, does not have to be the same as the performance, as the GPU programming model that you use in your user code. These can be different. Um, and you, you know, you want people to be, we, we want users to be able to choose, you know, what's most appropriate for their problem. So that's, that's it. And then um, we already saw in the SNES example, it's a sort of common pattern for how PETC applications work, where, you know, your PETC code's gonna, compute application specific data structures, um, user provides some kind of function computation callback, uh, maybe optionally provide a Jacobian or a Hessian or something like that for computation callback, and you call the PETC solver possibly in a loop. This doesn't change with the use of GPUs. The creation of the solver, matrices, vector objects, and their manipulation doesn't really change. It's just that uh, now, hopefully in user land, you are using uh, you know, CUDA or COCOS or, or HIP or whatever GPU programming model you want to calculate your physics uh, on the GPU. And of course, this means you're going to get some data structures that reside in GPU memory. Um, hopefully, you're able to construct them directly on the GPU, but sometimes you might need to construct parts on the CPU and copy it to the GPU. And then the, you, you want your function and Jacobian or whatever to call GPU kernels uh, if you want to get end to end utilization of the GPU. Um, and uh, so, like, I, I show here just a, a really simple example of, you know, basically what this lo looks like if you've got a code that you want to be able to, to use Cocos on the GPU or just run with the, with the reference implementations of the CPU. Basically, um, just if, if your code has a flag, use Cocos, you're going to, you know, say when you set the function in Jacobian, you're going you're gonna to call the Cocos versions of these. And then um, just here is showing a, a, a very simple example of like what a, a, a CPU reference implementation of your, uh, your nonlinear function looks like versus what the COCOS version looks like here, separated by this horizontal line. Um, really, you know, it looks almost identical, except that uh, in the CPU only case, we call something like DMDA vet get array read. Uh, which is going to give you uh, read and write. Um, you, you get uh, just you know, pointer, memory pointers to these. Um, you do basically the same thing in the case where you're writing uh, for, with, with a Cocos performance portability framework, except now you get these, these Cocos views into the thing. And then um, you know, in the CPU case, we just got this simple for loop, and in the Cocos case, we're using the Cocos parallel for. But I mean, it, it's, it's really very conceptually quite similar uh, how you use these things. And uh, same thing for, for, for matrices, but I'm going to skip over that. And then I'm going to talk about how PETC uses GPUs on the back end. So PETC provides several new implementations of PETC's VEC, it's a distributed vector, and MAT distributed matrix classes, which allow data storage and manipulation uh, in device uh, GPU memory. And what it does is it Im we imbue all the VEC and MAT objects with the ability to track the state of a second offload copy of the data. And we synchronize these two copies of the data only when required. So we use this lazy mirror model to avoid you know, unnecessary copies. And um, 
the sort of magic here is that because the higher level Petsy objects, your Stash, your KSP, your TS, whatever, uh, in the end these all rely on VEC and MAT operations, so execution is going to occur on the GPU when the appropriate you know, GPU targeted delegated types for VEC and MAT are chosen. So basically what this means is um, you know, I can take some of the examples that I was running before and I can say you know, run with a CUDA backend on an NVIDIA GPU by just saying, hey, instead of now using the default uh, AIJ matrix type, now my matrix type is AIJ QSparse, and my VEC type is CUDA. And uh, basically, I just do that. And because Petsy has separated the high-level control logic from the optimized computational kernels, um, even a very complicated, you know, hierarchical, multi-level domain decomposed, uh, you know, physics-based solver can run on different architectures by just choosing the appropriate backend at the runtime. You don't have to recode anything. So um, again, I have some. If you if you have access to a GPU machine, um, you can try some of these examples. And uh, let's see. Uh, you know, actually, I'm, I really want to make sure Matt has has time. So I'm just going to say, you know, look at the slides, and you can, you know. You can, you can see it's very simple. You're just adding some things like saying, um, you know, in this case, I'm, I'm adding a, my, uh, my DM vec type. Scooter. The reason there's a DM here is because I'm getting the vectors from this, this uh, DM object that manages my grid. So I say, hey, DM, please give me vectors that are CUDA type and matrix type is AIJ QSparse. And you run it, it's great. Um, I am going to skip over, unfortunately, the, the talk about how you interpret the Petsy profiling data because it's, it's, it, there are pretty good explanations in the slides that you can look at later. And the really cool thing I want to point out is that Petsy now supports, in, just with the, the, the native logging framework, um, writing out all of the event data uh, into a, a stack file that you can use to uh, generate flame graphs. Uh, if, you, if you read much like HPC kind of oriented literature in the last several years, you'll have noticed a lot of visualizations of performance using uh, Brendan Gregg's flame graph um, kind of hierarchical way of looking at things. Um, you can now just tell Petsy to, uh, to generate these things. Let's see, do I have an example? And yeah, I have an example here. Just instead of saying log view, normally you'd say log view and give it the name of a text file. You could say log view and then you tell it um, that it's an ASCII flame graph. It writes it to the flame graph format that you can use with Gren Gren and Greg's Perl scripts or you can use with uh, something cool like I like the speedscope.app website that lets you interactively just explore this stuff online. Um, you can do this and it's, it's super cool and it's actually um, really the only way to get a really interpretable view of you know, like what's really happening in like some complicated multi-level solver, like where, where the time's being spent. Um, and so there's a bunch of stuff to try that I encourage people to look at um, on, on my, uh, either in these slides or on the link to the web page that has you know, things you can cut and paste. And uh, I think we should transition now to Matt, uh, yes, Mark. Yeah, here, I'll, um, oh, I'll, I'll just repeat what Mark was saying. And yeah, this is a great thing to add. So, um, so uh, Samir Shende and Kevin Huck at the University of Oregon and Paratools um, worked with, with me to add um, support for the, the TAU Tuning and Analysis Utilities, TAU, uh, performance toolkit that lets you do you know, like very low level profiling and it, it knows about Petsy logging events and stages. Um, and so it's, uh, it, Definitely look at that too if you want more detail than you get out of just the flame graph um, from the from Petsy's logging framework. Yes. All right. Okay. Well. Can probably be there. All right, and I don't have to do anything special, right? I just plug in. Just plug, just plug in. Okay, so there's time to do some stuff.
uh, which is good. Um, and it's important to go over those GPUs because I think I think 90% of our web traffic is how do I run with the GPU? Yeah, should be good. Okay, so I was trying to figure out how to do something like this, and so it's hard to compete with Richard's slides. He, uh, he makes beautiful slides. So instead of making beautiful slides, I wanted just to, to show the code. So my idea was that what we can do is look at actual examples that are already in there, and I want to tell you how they work and what we're trying to do with them. We'll see how far we get. Um, here's a, like a representative like a list. So there's no, Poisson, linear LCD, Stokes, a couple of couple problems, problems, heat equation, poral elasticity, central forces, tomography. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, I was yeah, muted I was because it was repeating. Uh, hold on. I'm so. It's okay. Get rid of that and un unmute there. Is it unmuted? Okay. Zoom. Oh, I gotta I gotta unmute myself on Zoom. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. So um, Hansel's gonna talk about tomography. Uh, Dan and Joe will talk about the particles. Yeah. Screen sharing. Screen. Oh. Okay, no problem. I can do it. Share screen. Click. Hold screen. Share. They are. Uh, except for this slide, which I made while I was listening to Rich, and I didn't remember to make it yesterday. So uh, I will put this one on the Slack channel when I finish talking. So. I'm not going to talk gonna about a bunch of those. I was thinking of showing you elasticity and uh, the heat equation and, and BO. So we'll see how far we get. Um, so suppose you want to do this. Why do you want to do this? I built this so that we could test solvers because I needed to easily generate elasticity problems so then we could look at the solver performance. And then I. I also wanted to use it because I work on this code pilot that models uh, the elasticity in the earth for earthquakes and also the crustal deformation that happens between earthquakes, the, the aseismic stuff. So I, I wanted to build a simple thing where I could test stuff out. So how do you do it? And I think understanding this kind of representation is important because this is how high performance stuff, in my opinion, works now. So the Libseed project, which I'm not going to talk about because uh, Jed will talk about it, is a rethinking from a performance standpoint of the operations for finite elements, but really you can do, other, you can do any stencil thing with this. So we, we've implemented some finite volume stuff now too. Uh, and the heart of it is something we we talked about before seed, and in fact, Petsy worked this way before seed was a project or a, a thing, and that is to look at the weak form, uh, and here is a representative weak form, uh, the gradient of some test function times some other function, and it might have a number of components where the C is a component index. Uh, so for instance, here's linear elasticity written in this way. And the reason for writing it in this way is to look at what stuff you need to know and what stuff I can figure out automatically. So I know everything about this test function here. And, and I know everything about the basis functions there. And I know all of the um, coefficients. So I can evaluate any of those functions u anywhere I want. I know what the integral is. I know how to break up the integral into it because integrals are additive, so I can break it up any way I choose, for instance, over cells. I know how to do that. I know how to do an integral over a cell with quadrature. So the only thing I don't know is I don't know the form of this equation here. 
I know the u's at arbitrary points. I know the size at arbitrary points. I know what points I want to use. And the only thing I don't know is the form of this thing. So this leads to the idea of a user interface where the user says, well, this is the form of the function, but doesn't get in the way of doing the integral or choosing the basis function or anything like that. So the Petsy examples are coded in this way. And this is also how seed codes things. Uh, and so we're converging on a model. My belief is that this model convergence will, take, will be the kind of the same thing that happened in sparse linear algebra. Everyone agreed we would do sparse linear algebra some way. Every package looks the same. Hyper is the same. Trilinos is the same. Petsy is the same. We all agreed sparse linear algebra looks one way. And now everyone can interoperate. This will happen with finite elements, I believe. It's getting there. So I'll just, uh, uh, here is it with uh, reduced to um, index form instead of, you know, with nablas and stuff like that in case it was not clear how the things are being summed. I hate, sometimes I can't figure out with the transpose what's going on, so I need to write it all down. I, I like it to be concrete. So let's look at the code. So F1 Elias U. So what's going on? Oh, I was fixing something. So I found a bug here while we were talking. Um, that's the usefulness of tutorials. So here is, and let's, you know, kind of, you can see what my coding environment looks like. It's a little bit messy. Let's clean some stuff up. So here's the user interface. So a number of parameters. Uh, seed is, uh, which was written later, is, is much nicer in that you can kind of declare the parameters and they don't take up all the space, but I did this first, and so it's uglier. So there's a bunch of parameters that come in, but the important thing to see is basically what's coming in are evaluations of the fields and maybe evaluations of some auxiliary fields and some constants, and then we, s we give back the residual at this point this point x and t, so a point in space-time, right? And what is it? Well, there's the shear part, right, where this is uh, nabla u of cd, this is nabla u of dc, the transpose, and then there's uh, the divergence of u times lambda, right? And so my whole problem is right there, and that's it. And so that's how we can write down Poisson and uh, elasticity and Stokes and all these things with very little change because you just change these what, what I'm going to call pointwise functions. So I'm doing it for the residual. Can I do it for the Jacobian? Yeah. The Jacobian can be written in a very similar way, right, uh, where that's some tensor G and uh, I'll put all the uh, the indices in, and it's actually really a simple thing here, where there's uh, mu's for uh, two entries on the uh, the tensor and lambda on the diagonal, right? And so it's very little code, uh, and uh, now I have. Basically the problem, well, I have the symbol, right? I don't have the boundary conditions, but boundary conditions can be written in the exact same way. So I'll show you, there's, uh, I have a problem that's axial compression, so I'm pushing on uh, or pulling on the edge of it. And so uh, it, here's the exact solution and the boundary condition. So let's look at the boundary condition. Um, this Axial disp, probably that's, there we go. So here's the exact solution of pulling on it, and here's w what happens. I just pass in a constant, which is, there's some constant uh, uh, tension that I, I put on there, or, you know, could be compression if it's negative. I think I'm solving it negative here. And so I just uh, have a pointwise function and this is an integral over the boundary instead of an integral over the bulk. But I think this is how everything should be specified. The reason is the following. Uh, this allows you to specify it in a way 
boundary conditions are independent of the mesh I choose to use, independent of the dimension that I choose to be in. And so I can change the mesh from under this. I can change between hexes and tets or, you know, pyramids, and this will still work. And uh, I, I think it's the right way to talk about boundary conditions rather than the very uh, fragile way of saying, well, at this n node or at this point, there's this value. I, uh, I want to be able to refine along the boundary or something like that. It, um, so in my mind, this is, this is the way that we should be talking about these things. Okay. So, uh, Once you say, okay, I have these pointwise functions, they define my problem. I have a pointwise residual, I have a pointwise Jacobian. You don't need the pointwise Jacobian, we can do it, but it, it's nice to have in case you want to do sophisticated preconditioners. And you have the pointwise boundary conditions. And so once you have those, and that's what these functions are, what, do you, what kind of scaffolding do you need to put around them in order to get a fully functioning example? So that's what I want to show you. So, there, I, so look, I have tried to write sort of classes or that kind of thing where all this boilerplate goes away, and then Jed gets angry and says that you can't see anything that's inside and it's just totally unintuitive, and I, to I, I think that's probably right, but it's annoying because there's a huge amount of boilerplate that is exactly the same in all these examples. So I, I don't have a solution. Uh, but we're going to go with the boilerplate today so everyone can see what's happening. So what's the boilerplate? Well, every, you know, you got to initialize. I always have a process options function. All it does is read in the options that are specific for this test. Uh, I use Petsy bag to manage param uh, parameters, constants. The reason is um, I can uh, give them units. Uh, it serializes. Uh, it prints help. You know, it does some nice things. And so that's what I do. You'll see in the BO example, I have like 30 parameters because there's so much crap that gets thrown into poroelasticity. Um, so I, I, this, uh, this set of parameters just reads those in from the command line or gives them default values. And then I create a solver. Here it's a nonlinear solver, but the same thing works. You'll see it's TS create or tau create or swarm create, you know, or not swarm, sorry, um, just the solver create. Then I create a, um, a domain representation, and here it's going to be plex. So let's go up there and see what this function looks like. So uh, it really could be simpler. Uh, imagine we just throw that away. This is sort of the most basic thing. You create a DM, you set the type, set from options. You don't even really need the application context, but I just did it anyway. And then I usually have a view so I can look at what I'm doing, right? And this is all you really need. Here, I just, I want to, you know, some of these elasticity discretizations are sensitive to, you know, if you shear, um, if they don't preserve corn, right? Um, so I wanted to try that, but you don't, it's not necessary. Uh, and you can do a lot of that from the command line. Um, and then once I have that, so I, ha I set up a mesh, and I try to drive everything from the command line now. Uh, I think we are it uh, so heavily reliant on meshing uh, where you have human intervention, where you're like, Oh, I'm going to bring it up and look at it and then change the little stuff here and then save it in a mesh file and read it out. I dream about meshing being totally programmatically driven. I think that's the future. Um, and mesh programs, in, in my mind, are crazy. They are Byzantine Rube Goldberg machines of all sorts of crud in them that make compilers look easy. And what they should be are simple chains of predictable and easy operations. And that's what we try to have here. So in what Plex is, is a thing that reads the simplest possible mesh in, or, or calls a generator, and then alters it in predictable ways that uh, you need for your problem. So sometimes it's called adaptive mesh refinement, but that's, 
It, I don't have the same point of view of, as many people who do that, so I tend not to say it, but that's the idea. So once I've created a mesh, I need somehow to have a representation of functions on the mesh. So you have the topology and you have the dual of the topology, which is the space of functions over that topology, right? So how do you do it? So I have this function set up, uh, create, set up finite element here. And what I'm doing, I say, um, get me the cell type of the highest dimensional cell in the mesh here. And then I tell um, Petsy to create me a finite element that's appropriate for that cell type. Yeah, I mean, I used to try to not have that, but uh, it, it wasn't very, it, there were all sorts of corner cases. So I just, I just changed to do something like this. So you can have sort of tensor product cells like prisms and it'll do the right thing and stuff like that. Um, but I'm not in love with that. It's just, it works okay. Then we, uh, we say, look, um, use this discretization for a field in the DM, and fields are intended to mirror like physical fields, um, stuff that has one representation. And you can have as many fields as you want in the problem. They can have extent that uh, does not have, you know, cover the whole domain, so you can tell it, I only want it over this part of the domain stuff like that. You can have them over lower dimensional sections. And then once I have told it all my disc, uh, told the DM all my discretizations, um, it knows how to allocate all the storage because it has a description of the discretization, it has a description of the mesh, and so it can lay everything out. Uh, and I don't need at this stage to know everything about the discretization. I just need to know kind of how big things are. And so if you want to manage your discretization, fine. Let me make a model of how big it is. Then I can lay everything out and also manage all the parallel communication. But I don't really need to know the analytics of what you're doing, right, as long as I know how big everything is. And then this function does all the processing, finds the intersection of all the you know, domains that you've declared fields on and lays everything out and that kind of stuff. And then setup is, is just something I, I put in here. It just calls a function to define the problem. And so what do you need to define the problem? Well, you need to tell me these pointwise functions. So you need to tell me the pointwise function here. I'll go to the, the one that I care about, the axial, you know, where I'm tugging on it. You need to define elasticity, the residual and the Jacobian. And then if you want boundary conditions, which I do, I want a natural boundary condition on the right-hand side, a, a non-uniform one, uh, tension. Then I need to tell you, OK, somehow I need to describe where this boundary condition is. So the meshes have a facility for subsetting. Uh, it's called labeling. Uh, so DM label is a thing that can mark part of a mesh. And so I use those for boundary conditions you know, initial conditions for uh, subproblems, anything you want to do subsetting for, that is what is used. So here we say, oh, get me the label, the named marker, which is the one that I by default put on the boundary of the mesh. So get that one out. And then um, a particular ID. So I divide, a, I have different label IDs for different pieces. So I get the ID that's the right-hand side and I say, okay, put it, uh, use this pointwise function uh, for the right-hand side. And you can see, so we started having many different kinds of pointwise functions. So there's residual one, there's Jacobian one, there's ones that integrate over the boundary. And so eventually it became so, you know, such a big thing that I just made something to handle it. So this says, okay, um, a... I, each of these pointwise functions has a key. There's a label that tells me what part of the domain it, it covers. Uh, well, label and ID pair that tell me where in the domain you want this thing to apply. There's a uh, field index that tells me which field this particular pointwise function applies to. And then I have a part number, which you can interpret how you want, but I'm using it to distinguish between left-hand side, right-hand side for IMEX type of things. So you give this composite key in, and so I can 
now what I do is all these pointwise functions are stacked in with different keys, and then you can retrieve them by key to decide to do something. So for instance, if you want to do fully implicit, I pull them all out. If you want to do semi-implicit, I pull some out. I, I put the others on the right-hand side. So I, it can be flexible. And uh, here, I'm just doing a simple thing, which is applying this boundary condition at this place for field zero. That's it. And you can have many different uh, pointwise functions for the same thing. So you can have like a bunch of, so you can stack them up if you wanted to have several pieces of your residual. So this is function number zero. But this allows you to declaratively specify a problem. So instead of the problem being instantiated as this code that runs in this place, what I'm doing is saying, my problem is defined by these functions, and then inside I can decide how the control flow goes. When do I assemble? What parts do I assemble? Do I partially assemble it? Good, you know, and so this, the idea then is this all back ends into seed, where I use this information to create seed operators on the fly that do all this evaluation, so I don't have to manage it. That's how we get portability vectorization, all that stuff. This strategy is almost working. Uh, Jed and I had a disagreement. Um, he thinks that people are awesomely smart, and so uh, everything is bare bones in seed. It doesn't do any transformation. So for instance, if you look at one of these pointwise functions, like the elasticity one, let's look at the elasticity. Uh, F1 ELAS, right? So here I'm using UX. What does that mean? Is that the derivative in the real space, in the reference space? And in C, that's the derivative in the reference space. So you have to know what to do. Uh, so you have to understand what kind of element you might have. Is it one that transforms with Piola, or is it transformed just like uh, H1, you know? And all of that stuff is up to the user. Uh, in seed land, that's awesome, because the user will know how to optimize it. For me, I would rather have it all done for me, even if it is slower, because I don't have to think about it. So, you know, that's the impedance mismatch right now. Once we resolve all that, uh, we'll be able to seamlessly do everything, I think. So. Once you have a mesh and a discretization in your equations and your boundary conditions and your parameters, then you can do the solve. And how does it happen? So uh, if you don't see, Richard showed that um, you have this form function callback and a form Jacobian callback. But say that you don't do anything. Say you, you don't specify any of those. What happens? Well, if you have a DM associated with the solver, and that's the first thing we do down at the bottom, Oh, come on. We do SNES set DM. If there's a DM there, it will ask it, OK, you didn't tell me what to do for the residual. What do you do? And it will give a default answer. Here, oh, someone has told me about these pointwise functions. Use them. What, do, what about the Jacobian? OK, someone has told me there's pointwise functions for the Jacobian. If, there's, if someone didn't say that, then they say, OK, well, let's do finite differences uh, or something like that. And so the solver asks these questions of the DM and says, I need a residual. I need a Jacobian. Build it for me. And the DM does that building based on the declarative specification that's been given at the top. So this is the idea. This is, this is the idea, I think, of uh, how can you build a physically flexible way of talking about these things that's still complicated enough to do real problems, to have complicated meshes, to have adaptive refinement. So there are examples in Petsy with adaptive refinement. There are examples in 2D, 3D, 4D, 5D. I have a 5D example. Uh, there are examples w where we do hyperbolic, elliptic, parabolic, and 
So I just want to run a few of these so you can see how much, am I, I'm not out of time yet, am I? Good. So what I, I set up the slides to say, let's try and run some of these. So you know what, this is a little slow, Let, so I'm going to run something, I'm going to run the smaller one just so I, I can run faster. Uh, so here, oh, I'm messing around with that, okay, fine. So the test system, I run everything through the test system. I really like it, but um, you don't have to do it that way. So let's look at Q. This problem is just a block of elastic material, and this is purely to evaluate convergence rates. Um, is that not the name? To, oh, yeah, I'm missing. So you have to tell it what kind of MMS function to use. Okay, so what happened? Well, there was output that it compared against. So let's see if we can find that. There. So the convergence rate that it has is 1.6 for Q1, which is not quite 2. So what's happening? Well, this is in the CI, and so um, I can't crank things up like you'd really like to crank them up. Uh, so I just, I have one refinement and I, I don't do a lot of here. So if we crank up the refinement, uh, because, what? Oh, yeah, if you crank up the refinement, you can, you can get it to, and then, um, so I built this little thing, Convest, uh, which is, what it does is it packages up solves um, so that they're reified. So like a problem and a solve together is a thing because then I can do things to it. Like, well, I can refine it several times and repeatedly solve on, different, on a series of meshes um, because my problem is all declaratively specified. So instantiating a new problem is uh, easy and doesn't require me to know anything about the problem in the internals. So I can write things like this convergence estimator. So let's see what happens when I refine another. Right, so the, the convergence rate is 1.8, and if I refine another time, I can probably get it up to, to 1.9. So you can see it's asymptoting. So what it's doing is it starts out with this size problem, it knows the exact solution, so it can calculate, it can solve it, it can calculate the L2 error, and then uh, it has a bunch of errors, it has a bunch of sizes, it does the least squares fit, and gets the slope of the line, and, you know, modulo the dimension, and then it uh, spits me out the convergence rate. So, uh, this is very valuable, because this is a great way to test the combination of discretization and equation and make sure that my discretization is, is performing as I expect. Uh, it's a little bit more sensitive than just checking that you match, you know, or that looks like, you know, you get one of these uh, MMS tests correct. So um, I also, I have several tests in there. So this is one for the discretization error. It also can automatically do a Taylor test I think if, if I just turn it on, the, let's see, does this, yeah, okay, so um, I, the, that thing, there's a, you can call, there's an API for it, but it'll do, check the discretization error of the exact solution, um, which you can see matches the original grid, um, the residual of the exact solution, uh, which should be small, and it does a Taylor test on the Jacobian. So you do a bunch of uh, different size perturbations and you compute the uh, finite difference uh, action uh, versus the action of the Jacobian and the error term should go like H uh, squared. So I measure the uh, convergence rate of that and uh, this is an exactly linear problem. Uh, but if it was nonlinear, the convergence rate should be two. And check that. Yes. Just want to point out, in other testing functions, we provide utility for checking that your implementation of your gradient is appropriate to matching your objective, and yes. that your Hessian is appropriate to matching your uh, gradient.
gradient and your Jacobian to your residuals and so on. So you don't need to go in yeah. and write a bunch of finite difference tests yourself to make sure if you're hand coding those things that you hand coded it correctly. You can we have utility yeah. that will check that for you with the command line option. Not just in this DM mesh specific stuff, but throughout testing. Oh. Yeah, SNES test Jacobian. I usually do this. SNES test Jacobian view. So that will check. Oh, I do? Well, then it won't view it, uh, but it will check it. Hmm? Oh, yeah, I, I could. Yeah, I, I don't have to do all that. I'm, I'm needlessly waiting. So um, these three, this is uh, algebraic multigrid, geometric multigrid, and uh, a nice uh, core space that uh, Stefano put in for a DD. So uh, uh, you can try them all and see how they do on plain vanilla elasticity. Yeah, I should, oh, that, that's going to take forever on the refinement. You're right. So get rid. Oh, and I don't really want to do convergence estimation. So you can see that for each of the convergence estimation, it checks the Jacobian against the finite difference Jacobian, which should only really be accurate to single precision. So uh, this, is, this looks good. Cool. So uh, any question about anything? Because uh, the point is really um, that you should be able to like not only run these things, but get in and look at the code and kind of understand why someone would do this. I mean, it's always a war, right? Because it would be great if this were a really slimmed down, totally pristine, linear elasticity example. Then everything would be clear. But then it couldn't do anything. So I have to, there's a trade-off between making it a little messy so it can do more things and uh, keeping it clean enough uh, where you know you can see what's happening. E example 12, the Poisson example, uh, failed. Uh, it became so convoluted because every time I wanted to do a new thing, you would do it on the Laplacian first. That uh, we made an, I made another example 13 that's just a simple Laplacian example <laughs> because it was it got too complicated. Uh, but the idea is to explain why the example looks the way it looks. Uh, and then the idea here is to say, that is linear elasticity. Babies can solve linear elasticity. Uh, so can you do the same thing, but for a complicated example? So here's large deformation elasticity in this form. Uh, and I'll show you, I mean, we can just pull it up. It's, it's not a lot more complicated. Uh, and the beautiful thing about this is I did not write this. Uh, I do not understand large deformation elasticity very well, so I would have had a hard time. But it was, it was contributed. Um, and you can see that the, the function is not really that much more complicated, right? It just says, OK, instead of uh, the simple F1 there where I had you know, UX and its transpose, now I do have mu UX, uh, the full thing, plus uh, P times the cofactor of U. And that cofactor just takes in the matrix of derivatives and computes that thing. And it's, it's just a function right above, and it's not a complicated function, right? It just does this, you know? So, it's easy to write very complicated things. And if you want to see, so this is done in a way that's kind of easy to read, but it's not the fastest or best way to do it because those are always done by JED. So uh, in the exact same style, uh, here, five. Um, so JED. Brown P multigrid. He had, he has a paper here. Oh, why why does the search on archive is just 
four, right? I think we only have one paper together. There we go. So he does the same thing in this paper where um, he writes down uh, large deformation elasticity in this form, except I think he is all current coordinates and we're all original, um, uh, undeformed. Uh, and then he evaluates, it's kind of nice, he, he, he tracks exactly how many flops each, uh, each different kind of point-wise uh, uses. It's, it's in here somewhere. Is it there? No, that's the table of running stuff. Oh yeah, here. Um, he evaluates the different models that you can possibly use, like do I, do I have current and initial or initial and initial and how many scalars you need and how much time it takes to evaluate that, that point-wise function. And, they, and obviously, they, they like this one, right, where you're all in current configuration. So uh, that's, you know, that works for um, nonlinear equations, but can you do ex the same thing for time-dependent problems? Yes. Uh, and it's not that bad, actually. Um, let's see. EX45.CTS. Uh, I want tutorials. There. And you set up the same way. You say, OK, you know, process options, create the mesh. And the mesh creation is exactly the same mesh creation where, you know, maybe I should write that, uh, put that somewhere, and the problem setup is exactly the same where you give me a residual function. Here, I also get a right-hand side function so I can do explicit and implicit if I want. Give me the exact solution function so I can evaluate stuff. And uh, you set up the discretization the same way. I make a finite element for the temperature. Um, and I do need one more thing which produces initial conditions. So, uh, be, so my problem is fully defined. I need boundary conditions and initial conditions. And once I have all those, then I just create the TS, I set the DM, and now I can do my same trick, whereas before I would refine the mesh and repeatedly solve to get the convergence rate spatially, I can do the same thing temporarily. I go back to the beginning, I cut the time step down, and I keep evaluating. So you can get temporal and spatial convergence rates uh, automatically. And so f let's you know, do at least one of those, right? Um. Oh, I can stop. Uh, oh, I want to say one more thing. OK, you can run these. This will give you the spatial convergence rate. This will give you the temporal convergence rate. And this one, um, here, I'll just show you, and then I'll stop. So this one is kind of nice. Uh, it reads in a uh, step file. So, uh, well, I'll, oh, I'm reading in the EGADS light, but there's also a step version. So change EGADS light to STP. Uh, this, uh, now Petsy can read in and use CAD files. So it reads in a CAD file that happens to be a sphere, and it solves the heat equation on the surface of the sphere. Uh, oh, actually, no, I think I. No, I generate a mesh. It solves the heat equation in the ball. It, it generates a mesh for that surface and then solves it. And uh, so you can, uh, and it will refine, the refinement sticks to the CAD surface. So you can, uh, you can adaptively refine in the surface and solve, uh, and here is an example of doing so. Okay, so I didn't get everything I wanted to get to, but uh, hopefully uh, this, gives you an idea of the kind of things you might be able to incorporate, like automatic uh, convergence rate testing, um, uh, using DMs to help you flexibly assemble uh, sub-problems, course problems, patch problems, that kind of stuff, uh, in order to, uh, in order to e expand the solvers that you can use. I guess I could have talked more about patch solvers, I haven't yet, but you can ask, I can, you know, we can talk later about some of those other advanced solver stuff. Thanks. Is, did I, are there were any questions uh, about stuff? Um, I guess we can do questions in the, in the break.
So. Recording stopped. Hmm? There's like a Q&A period now. Okay, there's a Q&A period now. Okay, good.